What's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explain, we're looking at The Cursed, where in 19th century France, a mysterious, possibly supernatural menace threatens a small village. When a child goes missing, it's up to a pathologist to investigate the situation and exercise some of his own past demons in the process. I initially thought based on the trailer and mentions of Silver that this was going to be a pretty standard werewolf pick. I was pleased to discover that it actually has its own very distinct take on the werewolf lore. And I mean, the the thing doesn't even look like a regular werewolf. No hair, for one. It was in this aspect that the curse was most promising, but it also boasts exceptional atmosphere, with every foggy field filled with dread, and it is quite visually striking in a kind of reserved way, perhaps at least partially because it was shot on film. It's also a period piece, and it's got that whole gothic horror vibe going on that I am always a sucker for. Where it might show some weakness is in the very casual pace at which things unfold, it just feels a bit drawn out at points. There's also a some bigger concepts and deeper lore hinted at that don't get too much development, and that is a bit of a disappointment as well. But you know how we do things around here, dig into every little morsel that is left behind. So let's check out The Curse, breaking down the story, everything we learn about the werewolf and its particular characteristics tied to ancient gypsy curses, as well as explaining the ending and what it all means. Our story opens at the Battle of Somme in World War I, one of the largest battles of the entire war. The soldiers are all down in the trenches donned in masks and face coverings, but still coughing from toxic gases. And a whistle blows sends the trooper running out into the battlefield. The Germans get an old school chain gun ready and absolutely mow them all down. The medical tent is quickly overrun with soldiers suffering various injuries and get right into hacking off limbs, tossing a foot casually into a bucket full of other random human pieces. A doctor focuses on one soldier suffering from several bullet wounds and gets to removing them one by one. The soldier starts mumbling something to himself that sounds like a nursery rhyme. Five for a wedding, he repeats. The doc uncovers something else lodged in there and pulls out a markedly different looking bullet, importantly made of silver. The soldier croaks something about eight for silver, and then we leave the front lines of war to a more civilized country estate. A woman steps off a carriage and asks a maid how someone is doing. Not good, she sighs. She looks around several photos of the family, a guy there with kids, one girl and a boy. She hears the sounds of running footsteps and children playing, which flashes her back to 35 years earlier. We pick up with the woman Charlotte and her brother Edward when they were kids. Their mom Isabel steps in to break up the horseplay, asking Ed to stop teasing his sister. Concerning their parents' relationship, we really don't get too much detail, but they do seem quite distant. While she tends with the kids in the house, he's out hunting. He later happens upon her taking a bath, and the pair say nothing. He's not even like, hey, nice tits, honey, or anything. I mean, rude, he just leaves without a word, and she's clearly upset by the coldness displayed. Somewhere nearby the estate, a band of gypsies make their way through the misty area and set up camp. A woman asks her blacksmith associate to get the silver ready. There's a storm coming, and they've got to be prepared, she groans. Taking a bunch of silver coins in a box, he melts them down over a fire and pours the liquid into bullet molds. The blacksmith takes out a peculiar-looking set of teeth, also made of silver. The woman informs us of the importance of these possessions. They have protected it while it has protected them for generations. She places the teeth down and begins an incantation, noticing symbols etched into each tooth as her voice turns strange and echoey. The siblings are still awake and overhear the adults talking and decide to sneak a listen. It becomes immediately apparent that we're in the middle of a meeting made up of local landowners, known as the elders, and they have a problem with the gypsies that showed up out of nowhere. They claim the area belongs to them and Seamus wonders if that's actually true. The church guy is all, yeah, from 80 years ago, but it's nothing that can't be changed in their favor. Wow, real nice there, church guy. The topic of negotiation is brought up, but they said the gypsies weren't interested in any kind of settlement other than being able to keep the land itself. Seamus is adamant that they cannot let that happen, and it does also impact everyone else in the room, so they decide to pull the settlement money to hire mercenaries to take care of their little problem, which seems pretty harsh, but always pleasant church guy shrug that a warning is usually enough. The setup is pretty obvious here. These guys know the gypsies do in fact have claim to the land, but they're greedy and power hungry. So they don't give a shit, but they are gypsies after all. Usually a bad idea to screw them over, you know. If anyone's gonna get cursed, it's gonna be them. These Dilberts will learn soon enough as they descend upon the camp. They do offer for them to simply leave, but they are not interested. In that case, it's time for a brutal massacre of the innocent people, and they totally destroy their entire camp. 
the guys are not even remotely guilty, even posing for photos, clutching one of their dead bodies. Well, that's pretty messed up. They drag up the gypsy woman, the guy complaining she tried and failed to bite him with the teeth. The head honcho has little sympathy, spitting how dare they come up here with their fancy magic and trying to take their land. She retaliates it is actually their land, but he dismisses them, not wanting their kind around here. She then curses their dreams until they summon the Dark One. Then you'll know what death is, she threatens. Well, yep, yeah, see, I told you, across a gypsy, you're gonna get cursed, my guy. They throw an old coat on the blacksmith and jam sticks behind his arms and brutally chop off his hands and feet, filling in these stumps with hay. They're making their own real-life scarecrow. Again, kind of disturbing, y'all. They then kick the old lady into a body pile and bury her alive while she still clutches a teeth. Well, there you go. The elders' assholery and greed has cursed everyone involved. Way to go. Jeez. This is made even more abundantly clear when Charlotte has a nightmare. As the woman said, she would curse their dreams. She finds herself out in the murder field and strangely drawn to the scarecrow. Otherworldly whispering fills her ears, seeing flashes of them burying the body. She starts furiously digging at the earth, and the scarecrow shoots its head towards her, which brings her out of her dream. In the nearby settlement, a weary traveler comes into the inn for a room for the night. He asks the keeper guy about any gypsies in the area, knowing that he must be on the same trail as what's happening here. His gypsy inquiry, as well as writing down him being a pathologist in the guest book, already gives him away to the local officer Alfred, who joins him at the table. He tells him he knows about what happened in Gavadon, asking how he's been since then. John doesn't answer, and Alfred changes the subject to them needing a good doctor around here. But there's not much need, it turns out, except for cholera, which John snidely points out he can't really help with anyway. Pretty big historical reference with the cholera, but Alfred also mentions the Beast of Gavadon, which is an actual occurrence in French history, although it occurred many, many years before this story was actually set. The province was terrified by a man-eating animal for decades, and even the Kingdom of France got involved. Definitely seems like something similar is going on here. Ed then has his own poison dream, seeing smoky plumes out in the field. He too comes to the scarecrow, hearing screams, and then whispering. He digs up the set of silver teeth, hearing a raspy growl. He turns, seeing the gypsy woman standing ominously out in the distance. She starts floating towards him, and he screams, now awake, but outside at night. Well, that's weird. Sleepwalking, boy. The next day in town, the kids are all jumping rope and singing the same rhyme that we heard the soldier chanting. Each jump has a corresponding number. Five for wedding, six for birth, and seven for a curse that's buried in the earth. On that, Timmy stops jumping, gravely telling him he's seen it. Meaning Timmy has seen his own buried curse and takes the group out into the woods, swearing them to secrecy. They continue out into the fields from the dream and asks how many of them have had dreams about the scarecrow. Each kid sheepishly raises their hands, implying that they, along with everyone else around the settlement, probably are all sharing the same nightmare. Timmy surmises, well, in that case, let's dig it up like the dream wanted them to. Time to get our hands on some treasure. Well, not exactly treasure, but, yeah, okay. They argue on who's brave enough to do the actual digging, and ultimately, it settles on Timmy to do so. Ed says he has a bad feeling, and weakly leaps on him to try and stop him to no avail. He pulls out the container, everyone begging for him to stop now, but he strangely can't, appearing compelled by a force. The whispers grow louder, and his whole body starts to shake. Clearly overtaken by something, he jams the teeth into his mouth, and veins appear on his face. He immediately turns and attacks the boy, ripping the flesh from his neck. The others flee for their lives, still hearing his pain screams. Charlotte gets her parents' help, and they bring back the mostly unresponsive Ed back home, and call for a doctor. The doctor shows up, noticing the curtains are all drawn, Isabel excusing that the boy said the light hurt his eyes. Doc determines that he was bitten by an animal and that the wound has become infected. He's done all he can for now, assuring them he'll be back in a few days to check on him. That night, Charlotte has another nightmare, seeing flashes of them jumping rope and then her brother getting bitten. The scarecrow comes down off his perch to say hello, causing Char to lose her shit. Startled awake, she hears talking coming from her brother's room, finding him gasping and muttering breathlessly. She pulls the covers away, seeing what looks like tree branches crawling all over his body. She rushes to get her parents, and yet by the time they come back, Ed has vanished. Only a trail of blood and bandages left behind. The villagers join together to comb the forest, including Timmy. This is all your fault, Timmy! Word of the missing lad quickly makes it to Alfred, and then in turn to John. He doesn't understand exactly what he wants him for, but Alfred mentions they had a recent gypsy problem in the area, and this could be the connection that he's been looking for. While paying her respects to the church, Char runs into Timmy, who calls her over to the confession booth. He at least seems to not remember what happened. She tells him what he did with the teeth, and despite everything, she has kept her oath to stay mum. He 
reads from the Bible regarding Judas and the fee that he was given in exchange for Jesus, the man counting out 30 pieces of silver for his delivery. Timmy believes it is the same silver given to Judas that was used to make the teeth, and this bizarre curse has been spreading in one way or another since way back then, giving it a much more religious connotation. Timmy has grown quite holy in the aftermath of the incident and hands over another Bible page, believing that she might need it. And as for the teeth, not to worry. They're here on precious holy ground. However, all that new faith doesn't do him much good, as it turns out, first spotting what looks like Ed at the edge of the forest. He follows after, naturally winding up at the field. He hears what sounds like an otherworldly animal cry amongst the grass. Something unseen stalks right for him and quickly attacks him on the way by. He barely even notices that it nearly tore his hand completely off. He stumbles back into the woods, happening upon an old cabin of some sort. He pulls out a Bible page for comfort, but it doesn't provide much. Timmy getting overwhelmed by the briefly glimpsed creature out there. There's another snarl and it's bye bye to Timmy. John and Alfred then make it to the manor and Seamus has to inform them that things have only gotten worse since he called for them and takes them out to the site where Timmy's body was found. The kid has been mauled to all hell, maggots already feasting on his flesh. He peels back his jacket, finding the page for Ezekiel 22 now caked in blood. John identifies that he was definitely killed by a wild animal, a wolf based on its size. For Alfred, this is enough to conclude that Ed is also dead. He clarifies he's now trying to be insensitive, but there's the much wider spread cholera problem with huge ramifications going on. But John, on the other hand, decides to stick around a few more days. Seamus fills him in on the little they know about what happened to Edward. He was bitten and then was suddenly gone. He's concerned for the other families in the settlement as he's responsible for all of them and is hoping that John can find a way to resolve this grisly situation. He meets Isabel and they take him to the boys' room as well as around the house, leading to where he left via the back door. There, John notices a kind of substance caked on it and stares suspiciously out into the foggy forest. Out of an abundance of caution, he tells the family to board up the windows and doors on the ground floor, as there could be something very dangerous hunting out there. That night, John, as the others before, has his own familiar scarecrow starring dream. He too is driven to dig, intercut with flashes of the gypsy woman being buried. He pulls out the teeth and digs deeper, finding her decomposing body. A softer voice calls his name, seeing what must be his wife and daughter giving him a happy wave. He confirms as much later, but we understand he lost both of them in the previous attack mentioned at the end. To imply a further connection between the two, the scarecrow appears with his family and wraps his arms around them, leading them away. Then a ghoulish form of the woman appears and shocks him awake. During another silent dinner, Charlotte has a startling question. Are they going to die? Seamus shuts her down, wanting no kind of talk like that. Besides, John is here to help us find him. You gotta stay strong, girl. John collects a sample of the stuff off the door and observes it under his microscope. Upon first appearance, the cells look like they're dead. That is until he pricks his finger and adds some blood to the sample. Upon introducing it, the other cells spring to life, going right for the blood. His science time is disturbed by a loud thud, and when slinking around the house, he catches a peek of the creature just outside. He and Seamus step out, them spotting what looks like claw marks on the door. A baffled Seamus wonders what kind of animal tries breaking into homes. John admits that he won't know for sure until they set up a hunting ground to catch the beast. With all these startling developments, Seamus sets up a meeting with his land-owning buds, explaining John is here to catch and kill the animal. One guy is less than impressed, asking him what pathology is exactly. John describes it, saying that bodies speak after death, and he listens. While pathology or forensic science has been around well before this story takes place, it was only coming to prominence around this time. I mean, they didn't even believe in germs until around now. Stupid science, tell me to wash my hands. Oh sure, there's invisible little guys crawling all over me. <laughs> right, dude. John again references the beast Jabadon, and then he happened to be stationed there while in the army. He is starting to believe that the same thing there is happening here. The other bearded guy clamoring in that case, bring in the army. The only problem is they won't be sent in until there is an actual confirmation. In spite of all the mounting danger, a trio of poor souls are forced out into the fields to help out. Things go south quickly when Callum wanders off into the woods and the other guy, Jacob, hears strange wrestling nearby. Anne-Marie gets increasingly frightened and calls for Jacob. She spots him kind of slumped over there and tiptoes closer. Something is still there feeding on him and viciously bites at his body, violently flinging it around. She gets an eyeful of the beast and she attempts to flee. It leaps on top of her, chomping down on her neck. Calum is able to fit it off with a stick and gives her time to run, but he is quickly gored. She stumbles back to town, blankly relaying that she saw a dragon or something out there. That eh, looks more like a dragon than a wolf, 
hope that is true. Hearing this, John has more concerns. Namely, was she bitten? Once more, by the time they get to her room, she's flown the coop just like Edward did before. Now John knows what's going on here with certainty. They need to round up everyone in the church to limit exposure, laying it out plainly. Seamus and his people are being hunted. Wandering aimlessly around the forest, Anne-Marie is completely freaking out. She falls to the ground screeching, and branches start to crack out of her back. She wades into a river, unleashing another scream, and the branches drag her under the water. They all wrap around her and reaching towards the surface before they completely cover her body in a kind of cocoon. Everyone else is wrangled up in the church, except for a sleepless John and Isabel, who have a revealing chat. He spills about the specifics regarding his family. Javadon was plagued by a wolf. Two people were killed in the first week, six the following, and that's when the army came in. The first time he saw it, it was covered in fresh blood just outside their village. He rushed to their aid, but it was too late. 13 had been killed by the beast, including his wife and daughter. She gives a cheerful apology in hopes that they were at least able to catch the wolf. He continues that a short time after that, a band of gypsies came to town and said that the curse had had its revenge and now was going to be contained in gypsy silver. He tried to follow them after they left, but eventually the trail went cold. It really sounds like this roaming band of gypsies is just kind of wandering around cursing a-holes along the way and presumably went from Javadon to here, spreading the curse to an entirely new location. Isabel does have an inside scoop regarding a potential curse here, as the gypsy said they had a claim on the land. But Seamus steps in, putting his foot down. There will be no more talk of curses. John sets out in the morning alone to set up traps in the woods, mostly by where Timmy was found. He hears some suspicious sounds glaring out into the fog. He comes out into the field where the scarecrow lingers, flies now gathering around it, and goes right for the dirt, noticing that it's been dug up already. He gets back to work laying out more traps, and digs a big hole for a spike-filled contraption. He gets more flashes, seeing his family being placed into their graves, and then Anne-Marie with flailing tree tentacles. He suddenly comes to right outside the cabin remains. There's a snarl from over the wall, and he sees the milky limb there of the creature. He gets into position to try and trap it, the beast bursting out of the doors, just missing his neck, and tumbles right into the trap. He hurriedly reloads his gun. Ugh, stupid old muskets. The creature is trapped, impaled on several wooden spikes, and he fires upon it. The shot ring through the countryside. They lug the body back to the house and unwrap the strange creature, everyone in disbelief at the sight. John gets started on an autopsy, and after some serious labor, manages to cut open the skin. He moves the flaps back, seeing what is distinctly Anne-Marie in there, covered in a fleshy bubble. John must have been through this before, and says that there is no saving the girl at this point. They never come back the same. He forces Saul to take the shot, however painful it is to put the girl down. So now we understand with certainty how the curse spreads. Anyone that gets bitten and survives ends up changing into these somewhat werewolf-like yet also hairless creatures. This also means that the same thing must have happened to Edward as Seamus is starting to piece together. Always secret of Seamus, pleased with him to not tell his wife, but John is more interested in what else he's hiding, asking about the shared dream and the woman buried in the field. He tries to brush it all off as simply nonsense, but he points out her cursing the land is no more absurd than what they've all just witnessed and that it all started with Edward. He will keep killing and anyone bitten will will also keep killing until the revenge is satisfied. Yet in spite of all the evidence, Seamus still tries to play innocent. Randomly the next day, someone called Nana is leaving the house, and I'm pretty sure we've never even seen this character before now. Just kind of came out of nowhere. But Charlotte is at least upset. I'm like, bye, Grandma, I guess? Who are you? Didn't even have any lines or anything. John turns to Isabel for answers regarding her husband's actions, and she presents the photo that they took of the massacre. As she points out, it's the only trophy of his he keeps hidden in a drawer. James, James, James. John remembers the page that he found on Timmy, thinking he must have known something about the silver. He reads an underlined passage, as the silver is melted, so will you be melted in its midst, and you shall know the Lord has poured down fury upon you. Yep. Silver is bad. They return to Charlotte, who finally breaks her oath to Timmy and produces the page that he gave her. It regards Judas and the whole 30 coins thing from earlier, and now he thinks just as Timmy did, that the teeth were made of the same silver originally given to Judas. The question now is where is it? The church, as Charlotte remembers. The teeth are just sitting in the confession booth Timmy used. Oh yeah, nothing to worry about there. Just evil cursed teeth, just hanging out. John tasks the remaining elders to call Alfred. They need to get the army up in here stat. Oh, and a blacksmith as well. Time to make us some 
silver bullets. A mousy maid in East has to braid the treacherous perimeter to collect some clothes drying out on the line, continuously peering anxiously over her shoulder. The wind picks up flapping things everywhere, and she sees some pretty gnarly feet there underneath. As soon as she notices it, the creature attacks her, splattering blood all over the clean linen. Oh man, that's gonna be a pain in the butt to get out. She is severely injured, but still alive, which we know at this point isn't actually a good thing. The change is imminent. Meanwhile, John melts down the jaw to fashion some silver bullets to destroy the beast. Later, Seamus returns unsuccessful from his hunt, and Anise tries to play like everything is just fine. Not sure why exactly, perhaps extreme dedication to her job. I mean, she must know they're hunting some kind of beast. You just saw it, lady. John has been busy setting up fires to get a more accurate potential shot, and it's only now that anyone notices the bloody laundry. He comes down asking about the maid, but Seamus, still proud and stupid, growls that he just wants him to leave. John is through playing games. The creature wants you and your kin, and reminds him the gypsies did have a legit claim to the land. He argues that he took it, well, more like stole it, and well, as a result, he lost his son. He damns his selfish actions, as it was thanks to people like him that he lost his family. Isabel tries to temper the situation, she just wants her son back. He volleys to Seamus to explain Edward's fate, and he only tells him again to get out. John feels like he's finally realized his role here. He initially thought he was tracking a beast that killed his family, but now understands that he's more like a caretaker, putting this thing back into the box before it can kill any more people, and says he's not going anywhere until the army arrives. Anise is not looking so good, bleeding out from her bite and hyperventilating, and the treaticles start to crest from her back. It's Seamus that hears her moans through the vents and grabs a gun, tracking the sounds to the maid's room. He opens the doors, and it appears that she's gone already like the others, finding her bed empty. The wind whistles, and the new beast appears, knocking into the floor and chowing down. Isabel and John happen to run into each other again, this time over a squeaking tea kettle, and he wonders where is Seamus. He fires and kills the creature, but a fire has spread through the room. Isabel points outside, saying Seamus went that way and he trails after, sending her back to get her kid as the house is on fire. He discovers Seamus down on his knees, who admits he sees the same flames in the dreams of his actions every night. He also knows that since he was bitten, he is going to change, and tells him to tell his family he's sorry. He lays down the torch, lighting the alcohol, and is quickly engulfed in flames. The girls are about to head downstairs, but have to change course when encountering the Edward Beast. It stomps around outside the door and passes right by, both doing their best to stay silent. Once it goes by, they take the moment to flee, John escorting them outside. He knows they need to get to the church, and in the forest they come to Nana's overturned carriage, along with several mangled bodies. Hearing growls approaching, they get to the ground for cover, but Char cannot stay quiet, having to lie feet away from her precious dead Nana. The creature shoulders the carriage, and John readies his gun. It rounds the corner briefly before retreating for the moment, as though it didn't want to attack them. It's like, they're not guilty, you know what I mean? The three make it to the church and update the others on the ever-worsening situation. Seamus is dead, and the manor is on fire. Timmy's dad is tired of waiting and wants to kill the beast, but John tries to convince him of a better plan. They have something that it's afraid of. Silver bullets! They need to wait until morning, and then they'll draw it out and take it out once and for all. This appeases them for now, and John informs Isabel that her husband wasn't a total asshole after all. He did say he was sorry. Whatever comfort that gives you at this point. She still wants to know if her boy is lost to this nightmare, and an unsure John sighs that he can't say. It's not looking good, but we haven't seen what happens if the beast is shot with a silver bullet specifically. Isabel takes a knee to pray, and offers anything that she can for just a little mercy from the Lord. Everyone else is asleep, and she hears strange sounds and then howling coming from the front doors. The voice changes to Edwards, innocently asking for mommy's help and to come and get him. She is fooled by the ruse, and flings the door open as the others start rousing awake. A few try to close the doors, but the beast is already here, stepping out of the fog and rushing inside. It's an immediate bloodbath of madness, the beast taking out several of the group, and also provides a convenient way to get rid of the surviving elders. A body is flung at John, causing him to drop his silver slugs, cutting between the wounded soldiers from the beginning and the werewolf attack. War is like werewolves? Isabel shouts to her son, that's enough, and John urges her to get out of the way. She chooses to stand still, and he fires the bullet right through her and into Edward. She very dramatically collapses to the ground, intercut with the silver bullet getting extracted from the mysterious soldier in the introduction. Isabel looks over, seeing Edward in his original form has returned. Then we're back at the war zone, the doctor noticing the man's dog tags, reading off Edward Laurent. I think I honestly didn't even pick up on this the first time I watched this, but Edward is obviously the kid turned werewolf, but at the battle we're seeing him 30 years later, a grown up Edward now on the front lines of war. The silver bullet was 
still lodged in his body all these years. Isabel weakly reaches out to her son and takes him in her arms, then seeing him in the present, getting his face covered up, now dead for good. But as a child, he gasps back to consciousness and turns to his mother crying, knowing that she's gone. Now we look back on John's recent conversation. Is it possible to bring him back? We know now that it is possible, apparently, thanks to shooting the beast with a silver bullet. We saw with Anne-Marie that the original human is still in there, but John thought before that there was no salvation. Again, the difference being the silver bullet. It allowed Ed to essentially be saved from his fate and also assumedly prevented him from changing back to his monstrous form ever again. In the aftermath, John boards up the remnants of the estate and Charlotte hands over the three remaining bullets. She tells him that similar to Timmy, Ed does not remember anything. The boy there quiet and shell-shocked. John goes to talk to Ed, telling him that they're going to come live with him, to which he silently agrees. John gives him a big hug, assuring him none of this was his fault. We are then brought back to the present and see what older Charlotte was doing here. She approaches a much older John now, and a voice tells her it's time. We then return to that same picture of the three of them from before. We can piece together that the kids must have lived with John until adulthood, and well, at least in some way was able to get his family back. Too bad for Isabel, though. And see, the silver bullets are there, all four! As we remember, young Charlotte handed over three, which means that she must have in the present day visited her brother's body in order to retrieve the final one. Since they used the teeth to mold the bullets and they are still in their possession, they have effectively stopped the curse for good. There's no way for it to spread. Similar to what John said earlier, he's become like a caretaker, putting this curse back into the box before more people get killed. And he did succeed at that for at least 30 years, as we see, so nice jab. Hopefully Charlotte will take up the task after he passes. Don't want that hairless beast getting loose again. Again. That brings us to the conclusion of this ending explain on The Curse. And don't forget before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of The Curse and its ending? What's your favorite werewolf movie? Obviously American Werewolf in London, maybe one after that, I don't know. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.